Masters of Innovation. Looking towards the future with anticipation. Raising up the technological conversation from the east to the west and all across the nation. Cause knowledge is the cure, then we got the medication. We're the masters of innovation, the masters of innovation. We're the masters of innovation, the masters of innovation. Welcome to the Entrepreneurial CPA channel presents the Masters of Innovation. We're here to take a deep dive in the knowledge needed to break free of the dogma holding you back. We're here with a cutting edge innovation you need to rethink how you look at the world and how you look at the problems you're faced with. I'm Garrett Wagner, entrepreneurial CPA, your titan of the titanical, and I'm joined by the man who cannot be defined, the masters of knowledge, Joe Brunsman of CPL Brokers. And on today's show, we're going to go on beyond just the basics of the CCH breach and, and go past that. Because at this point, Joe, I think everybody knows that CCH got at a breach a couple weeks ago. We really right. want to talk about briefly, like, what happened and really kind of where do we go after that and how preventable it is, the new world we live in, and so on. But briefly, since you're a much bigger cybersecurity guy than I am, what do we know that happened so far? So, you know, initially kind of the, the first indication here came on about May 6th when Walters Kluwer CCH um, said that they had network and service interruptions. So we didn't actually know what that meant, but, you know, in their defense, they said that out of an abundance of caution, they took all of their systems offline, or at least a number of their systems offline. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of that information kind of came after the fact. Mostly what happened was, you know, we just got a ton of calls, dozens and dozens of calls from our clients going, hey, I think something might be wrong. Uh, CCH isn't working and everything's down. And that's where, you know, depending upon what software they had, you know, if it was, say, pro access um, or if it was, you know, any of that information. Yeah. You know, so for us inside our firm, we use CCH. So, yeah, the, our mm -hmm. access suite was down. Um, the tax e-file system was down, the help support line was down, the help website. So a bunch of like different and seemingly, seemingly unrelated products were down. Exactly. And, you know, at that point, it was just rumor mill to the extreme. So yes. the yeah, only I saw a lot of stuff on some, some Facebook chats, some social media chats, kind of avoided all that and just waited for some actual information to come to the place. Joe, were you busy in the social media channel? Like, Typing away with the conspiracy theories? No, so I, I wasn't, uh, well, I was cruising on Reddit trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, just to get, they tend to kind of get up to speed a little faster uh, yeah. because, you know, it's anonymous, so people can be a lot more informal there. Um, but, you know, kind of the first red flag I saw was they said that somewhere up in Canada, allegedly, there was a virus outbreak. And so they started sh kind of shutting everything down, and it could have been potentially been something called mega cortex, which is a really kind of a big deal. So that was really the first indication that we got that, you know, this, this isn't a, uh, you know, some configuration error. This could be something much more serious. Yeah. And it was serious. It was down for several days inside the firm. We were, we were at a halt for a while and eventually it came back up and there was a whole uproar, but now I think they've released some statements kind of explaining a little bit, but we still don't know much what happened. So more of Joe, let me ask you kind of like, from your insurance cybersecurity standpoint, what's the future look like as this unfolds? What can firms expect to hear more of? So really kind of broad picture, I would say that firms can expect this to happen more frequently. And I'm not saying it's necessarily going to be CCH going to be going down more frequently. It's going to just be businesses, firms of all stripes and colors are going to just be going down more frequently. So it's, it's quickly becoming apparent that this is just an inconvenience of living in the modern world. So as much as computers are useful and they've increased our productivity uh, beyond anything that, you know, our ancestors ever saw, the downside of that is going to be, you know, continuously, we're going to be having another new mega breach coming out um, as well as kind of all of the smaller breaches that aren't as well publicized, but will still lead to inconveniences. So, and, and Joe, that, that raises a good point. You kind of use the word like mega breach. Uh, sure. And I've heard from a lot of firms that have been in the speaking story lately, you know, some firms that weren't in the cloud say, great, this is validation to me that I should never go to the cloud. <laughs> but your, your key thing you said there was mega breaches and small breaches because 
when I looked at the statistics and cyber breaches, it's not just large companies that get breached. All companies get breached at pretty high alarming mm -hmm. rates. And, and my stance is, you know, I'll let me ask your opinion on this. So, you know, if, if I'm, if you're a small firm under a hundred people, can you get breached? And if you get breached, like similar to happen with CCH, are you going to be able to recover from that? Or are you just shut the doors time to go home? Sure. So, I mean, you're right. It's, it, you know, it's the mega breaches that really gain the attention. So, you know, for example, like the Citron breach, uh, which happened this week as well, has gained almost zero attention, you know, in the broader world. It's just CCH is so big. But, you know, the, the statistics are really hard to narrow down because, you know, a lot of companies don't report the breaches. They're getting better at it. But from all the reports I've read, it's going to be small to medium sized firms are really kind of taking the brunt of this. It's just the big firms that get the attention. So, you know, firms shouldn't be lulled into this kind of confirmation bias to think that if they just bring everything back in house, that somehow it's going to be safer because I think all indications really show that, you know, as much security and as many dollars as these big companies are throwing at cybersecurity, if they can get breached, then a small company that doesn't have, you know, 24 hours surveillance on their systems, it's just going to be that much easier. And it's, it's almost impossible now really for a small company to actually keep everything in house and do it well, because it's just getting too complicated and it's too overbearing. Yeah. I think if we're going to start talking through the ways that, a, let's say a hundred person firm or a hundred person company, the ways that a hundred person company can get hacked in a way they'd be out of business in 30 days. It's a pretty lengthy list. Oh, certainly. Certainly. Uh, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to prepare your people for all those ways. And even if you do, one of them's going to get through and you don't have the bandwidth mm -hmm. that to monitor it 24 um, seven. Something's going to happen. Someone's going to do it and you're donezo. Oh, and you're toast. And you know, more and more cybersecurity personnel, just that skill set is going to become more and more crucial. And the vacant job openings for that are going to become even greater uh, yeah. according to the department of labor. So for the ability for, you know, a small firm to really get somebody in there that's actually going to be, you know, really proactive, highly knowledgeable. To do that on any even vaguely affordable level is going to be borderline impossible for any firm outside of the few firms that get a unicorn here or there. But for the majority of firms, they're not going to be able to pay their, you know, IT staff members anywhere near what they would be getting somewhere else. So it, it's going to be a huge problem. And, you know, I don't know the exact numbers of cybersecurity people that work for, for CCH Walter Schooler. Oh, it's got to be hundreds, I'm sure. But I was going to say, I'm, I'm going to imagine to your point, let's say a 200-person firm. Mm -hmm. They might have more than 200 cybersecurity people alone to protect your data. A 200-person oh, sure. firm might have two, three people. Oh, certainly. You know, and they're not the the – most likely they're not these all-star brilliant people that are all like 24 seven monitoring everything. Cause it's too much to monitor. It's, um, yeah. It's just, it's too much going on. It's too hard. Um, you know, the knowledge level that you need to upkeep just to be able to do that job. Is, it's so extreme because it changes so frequently. And, and quite frankly, you know, there's something called a zero day exploit where <laughs> it's an exploit that nobody knows exists. So whoever it was at CCH that took all those systems down, that guy deserves a raise because he was on the ball and did what was, I mean, it must've been an incredibly difficult decision. He made it in the clutch, you know, whereas a small firm, if they've got guys working nine to five, if something would have happened in the middle of the night, you know, they're not going to have that opportunity to take all of their systems offline as a precautionary measure. No. So, you know, it's just, it's just another hurdle they would have to overcome that I think increasingly is going to be impossible for them to do. And that's one of the points, you know, a lot of these breaches, you know, some that I've read, some of when I teach cybersecurity, we talk about if you think it happens, one of the best things you do immediately is like unplug the internet from the whole office, everything, and turn everything off. Like as painful as that is, just unplug it all and go dark and let someone come in and look at it. Because the more times you leave it open to fix it, it's when the lights Exactly. Out. Exactly. I don't think, you know, I don't think many people have the requisite knowledge base to be able to 
you know, with, withstand some sort of intrusion and keep at least part of their system online. So I'd say, you know, for the vast majority of firms out there, the, the easiest decision is shut it down, cut it off, bring in the experts, let them handle it. Shut that bad boy down. So Joe, speaking of shutting the bad boy down, because this raises this whole breach, CTROM and CCH raises the question of breach response plans. And does, does a firm have one? What should they do? What does it look like? So without going into an hour long narrative, Sure. How do you boil that down for our listening audience inside firms. What do they need to know about breach response plans and what they should have in place? Mm -hmm. So a, a breach response plan, while they can get very complicated, and I recommend that firms don't do that, um, it's, it's very much, you know, when you boil it down, it's what is a breach? Does our staff understand what those, what those definitions are? Who do you call when you think something's going wrong? Who's going to be on the team to respond to that breach? Those are kind of the, the major elements inside of there. So once you take those elements, you can start, you know, parsing that down a million different ways. But it's very crucial that firms even, you know, fundamentally understand what a potential breach looks like. Or so, and with that, you know, Joe, I think it's important to remember what a breach looks like. It can be both electronic and physical. Exactly. So it doesn't have too many firms think it's just cybersecurity. It can be as simple as like the cleaning person stole the file off your desk. Yes. That's exactly. a breach. So, okay. So you understand what gets stolen. Number one, which is really any, the breach is really any sensitive personal identifiable information, name, address, social data birth. So it's, it's a little more nuanced than that. that. That's probably a good approach for most firms is to kind of start from the assumption that, you know, anything that has a social credit card number, debit card number, pen password, any access to financial information, um, kind of start from that assumption and then try to prove yourself wrong from the outside, uh, working backwards. But, you know, there's like 10 or 11 states, I believe now, and these laws change all the time, which is why I recommend that firms start with the assumption where paper documents are also considered under the breach notification statutes. Yep. Okay. So step one, what is it? What was step two again? Okay, so you need to know what is the potential breach, yep. right? Then we get into kind of the, the employee training, okay. which and says, okay, do training. your employees know who to call and what that breach looks like, okay. right? So, so the, do they, Yeah, so for us, it's pretty simple. We call Joe. Yes, you called me. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Help us out with it. Okay, what's the next step? Okay, so from then it's going to be, right, how do you essentially report that? and who's going to be on the team. So what we've seen in the past is when firms don't have, you know, at, at least some document that says this is the person responsible for X or Y or Z is the good idea fairy starts sprouting out of the ground. Tempers get flared. Stress is high. Everybody has the good idea. And that's exactly the wrong time to figure out who's on first and who's on second. So you need to make sure you know who's responsible for what. I like it. So, Joe, you know, with this, you got my wheels turning. I think we should do another episode so we're out of time. Let's continue on the CCH reach and let's talk specifically, this happened, what do firms need to do from an insurance from a breach standpoint based on what happened? Because I bet there's a lot of questions sure. out there, but a lot of firms don't know what to do. Let's spend some time in the next episode digging into that. So that, good. that's it for this episode. Thank you for tuning in, taking one step closer to becoming a master of innovation. If you've got questions that we talked about today, please send Joe or myself a message. You can reach us on LinkedIn, Twitter, wherever it is, hit us up and take it from me when I say this. If you were inside a CPA firm, you need to reach out to Joe ASAP for help with all of your insurance and cyber needs. I cannot tell you how many times we at our firm have leveraged Joe's knowledge to help us and make our life easier. So don't wait another minute. We've got a link below, click on the video, click it on, Reach out to Joe and get him to help you. And as always, we challenge you today to take action and change the world and invest in yourself.